Coming up on Nebraska Stories, Omaha's Blue Barn Theater finally has a stage all its own. From the NET documentary Bagel Boys, we learn about the game of res ball. See some of the fastest cars in the world and hear about the man who loved them. And digging along Nebraska's highways for new clues to our paleo history. So let's just work on the move, and it may not be right, right away, right? So can we rewind like this? Rewind for a second. I know it's kind of crazy, but that's all right. We're getting there. It is just two weeks away from an opening night that has been decades in the making. And the Blue Barn Theater's artistic director, Susan Clement Tober, is stretching her creative wings in new ways. This form is just not right. I want you to try and to go here. There is an aesthetic, and it is the approach slash process of going into a rehearsal period. It's still really grassroots. So let's go and do that same thing, only now. She's directing The Grown Up, the Blue Barn's debut production in their first here. ever very own theater space. I had been wanting to do the show for a long time, and it fit. It's about growth. It's about uh, jumping off into new worlds that you don't know what's going to happen. After 27 years of rental spaces, highs and lows, the theater company is all grown up. Artistically, we've always been sound. Business-wise, we've always been, we were just, we were a bunch of actors, you know? I think finally along the way, we've balanced those two sides of the coin. Shannon Walenta and I work really well together as a team on the business side. Blue Barn would not be where it is if she was not on board along with me. Founded in 1989 by a group of East Coast theater grads, Susan joined them in Omaha a year later and is the only remaining staff member from those early years. But the artistic mission remains the same. Ten. Put the knob on the door. We're an intimate off-Broadway, New York-style theater. You know, that's what we are, and it's our identity. We always have chosen our shows because they make an impact on us emotionally. And the work impacted others as well, inspiring a local philanthropist to donate a piece of land and seed funding for the experimental theater company to build their own space. To have somebody and also a group of people change your course of your life, your art form, your city, your personal life in such a dramatic way is um, astounding. While there is still great affection for their former home, some things they won't miss. We have air conditioning and heat that work, which is exciting. We have restrooms for our patrons and also backstage for our actors, which sounds really kind of silly for me to say, but it isn't after having to manage patrons and actors using the same restroom. But this is our, our light booth, which is... We have uh, theatrical lights that uh, we know we have the power to run them. It will certainly be nice for me not to have to flip the breaker in the middle of the show because the lights went out just the simple things in life and that we will really appreciate. But the last thing Susan wanted for the progressive risk-taking theater company was to move into a sterile new building. Instead, the theater is brimming with artistic embellishments you won't find anywhere else. To have artists work on this building and create things that are truly unique to Blue Barn's identity. I mean, it's like a big capsule of, of art. The space is art-driven, from the bricks in the entryway and the front logo welded just hours ahead of a ribbon cutting 
to the hand-milled wood beams in the lobby and lining the theater. What's ironic is these things fell into our lap instead of going to the landfill or getting burned or you know, just being cast off in a dumpster. We were able to collect these things and kind of tap their own creative aesthetic. Another unique feature allows the theater to open the back wall to another performance space. They have been lovingly named the Big Damn Doors, and they are magnificent. Nils, can you come over and end up here? Appearing in the first production in the new theater he helped start so many years ago, actor and founding member Nils Holland is still trying to take it all in. I can't believe it. It's still really, uh, it's really wonderful coming in here because it's, well, it's, uh, it's such a dream come true. Two weeks ago, there wasn't a lighting instrument hung in this place, and we got it all up, and we made art, and we got inspired by the ability to do more with more, I guess you could say, instead of always doing more with less. <laughs> So you want to tell me about this thing? You want to tell me this thing of yours? Bonnie says okay, so we are going to give birth to our first show here in our new space. And it's really awesome to have all of you here to, I was going to get through this. <laughs> to help us breathe life into our stage and into our work. So I thank you so much for being here. It is a show about savoring our moments, savoring experiences, and being grateful. And I am truly grateful. Cheers. Now that the Blue Barn has a permanent home, there is a new goal. To become a nationally known professional theater, a destination spot that people come to see kick-ass theater. I never thought that I would ever be here in Omaha, sitting in a brand new, incredibly beautiful space. There is no other space like this in the country, and I want people from all over to want to come here and experience what we put on our stage. You're going to man the pros next. You're going to have to learn to see better. The Blue Barn is now a key anchor in Omaha's revitalized South 10th Street corridor. Perhaps it was always destined to be right here. It's cool at night right now. I shut all the lights off. And I leave the Blue Barn sign on behind me because it glows you know, as you drive by. And, and uh, it feels like home, which is really incredible. expected to have everyone against them. The crowd is on its feet here at Pinnacle Bank Arena, and what an excited group. Matthew was probably about, I would say, third or fourth grade when he came in, and he said, Mom, am I Indian? Came down here battling for some respect. A lot of people said, who is Winnebago? Who are they? There's stereotypes against the Winnebago basketball team every year that they're, uh, yeah, they got talent, but they, they don't got to drive to win. It's so much more than basketball. It's more of a family thing. They love basketball here. Yeah, it's always been basketball growing up. It felt really good just to do that for the community. And can 
Congratulations, the Winnebago Indians are Class C-1 state champions. Res ball came through. Back to state has certainly been a long and challenging one, but now the Indians are bringing res ball to Lincoln. Winship hits again on the baseline. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is res ball is just an up tempo, uh, fast paced game. My philosophy is defense first. If we get defensive stops, we get turnovers, we get uh, rebounds, and we, we can push the ball faster. Running, quick shots, and hustle. Keep running and don't stop. You just keep going and keep going. Oh, my legs are just, I can't, I can't really feel them at the end of the game. It's just so, so, so. I think it's something that's been instilled in them as a young child. Growing up from the time they could dribble a basketball is you share the ball. It isn't about you. It's about the whole team on the court running as fast as you can, and just working harder than the other team that's, that you're playing against. Every sport is 90% mental, 10% physical. Ninety percent mental. He said that a lot. Good ball move by Winnebago. Winchick got it. Into the defense, and what a shot by the senior Cleveland. Winchick behind the back. So Winnebago wins the district championship and now on its way to Lincoln seeking their first state championship in 75 years. This is a collection of collections. It's a true history of racing and the automotive industry. If you go to the Indianapolis Museum, you see Indy cars. You go to the Drag Racing Museum in Florida, and you see drag cars. Here we have a, a wide variety of early racing history. Speedy Bill Smith and his wife Joyce are perhaps best known as the founders of America's oldest speed shop, Speedway Motors. But for Bill, cars were more than just his job. Bill started collecting pieces when he was 14 years old. So that would have been about 1943 or so. My dad would get frustrated because he wanted to show off his stuff. He was proud of what he collected. And I think some of his buddies finally got on to him about having all this stuff back in a warehouse. Nobody got to see it, and everybody that did see it say, Bill, you ought to have a museum. You ought to show the world what you've done. And in 1992, he did take that step. The museum quickly outgrew its original location. So in June of 2001, the collection premiered in its current location on Sun Valley Boulevard in Lincoln. I'd call him an entrepreneur. His love was cars, and what he was always looking for was a way to make money doing something with cars. He bought his first car when he was 14. He turned it into a business called Bill's Holly. There's a great photo of my dad in that truck. He was a great businessman, and, but I don't think he ever had the vision that the museum could be even bigger or more important than Speedway Motors. Starting with early engine development, the museum guides you through the history of the automobile and the racing industry. It begins at the turn of the century and progresses through to current technology. We're always getting in new items, and so we're always changing uh, the floor plan little by little. The artifacts are selected based on what we need to tell the story about. We have about 32,000 documented in the system right now. Some of them are as small as a pair of earrings, and some of them are as big as a uh, Duesenberg automobile. 
Some of these things go back to the 1910s. I mean, they're 100 years ago. It's almost like being a, a, a forensic detective sometimes. I mean, you're just, you're looking for clues anywhere you can find them. Bill's initial intent was to tell the story about how the engines were used. We found uh, one particular engine that was in the bottom of a farm pond. So these things don't come into the, the museum all the time, all nice and shiny. We have a shop, um, and they actually do the restoration of the engines. We do complete engine display. We build our own displays in-house. We have some great employees that are very artistic. They would take my dad's vision and turn it into reality. And his whole idea behind that was try to make it look like a work of art so that even someone that isn't interested in anything automotive would look at that and say, that's beautiful. Part of the thing that makes this museum unique is the breadth of offering. We have 120 cars in the collection, and we have everything from uh, midgets to sprint cars, indie cars, custom cars. We have 600 engines in the collection. But the collection doesn't just showcase cars and engines. We have about 500 lunch boxes on display, about 800 pedal cars, just different little artifacts from different people's careers. There's three cars that represent the 1960s custom car craze. We've got the George Barris Outlaw. Uh, there's the Red Baron uh, that was built in 1968. And then the uh, Boot Hill Express, which is actually our oldest artifact in the museum. It's based on an 1850 Cunningham horse-drawn hearse. It was actually originally used to carry James Younger's body to the Boot Hill when he was killed, part of the James Gang. You look at those three cars, and it's obvious that the 60s had all the best drugs. I mean, you just can't think up stuff like that without some, some chemical stimulants of some kind. <laughs> Preston Tucker was a very interesting individual. Tucker wanted something new and revolutionary, so he designed the Tucker Torpedo. Only 51 Tuckers were ever built. It was a very space-age looking car for the time. It had the center headlight in it, very aerodynamic. It was rear engine, which was uh, very revolutionary for the day. The center headlight actually turned with the front wheels. You literally could see around corners at night. John McKeegan, who's the curator here at the museum, built a race car to run at the Bonneville Salt Flats. I kind of got roped into going to the Salt Flats in 1986. The mistake I made was buying a rule book because you look through the rule book and you say, oh, that's a pretty soft record. We ought to be able to set that. And so we pretty much designed the car on a napkin at break time at work. We raced it for 22 years and I could tell you how many times. I had to drive it three times. <laughs> I know that. And the last record we set was 323 miles per hour. Still has two, two records right now. And that's good. <laughs> that means it's not easy. <laughs> The museum, it, you know, it, it evolved over time. It, it didn't, it didn't just, we just didn't open the door and here it is. And it, it just keeps evolving and it, to this day it's still evolving. Bill and Joyce dedicated their entire lives to tell the stories of the automotive industry. Now their four sons plan to carry on that legacy for years to come. The importance of any kind of museum is to preserve the history. We really are interested in being able to tell the next generations. Between March and November, Shane Tucker crisscrosses Nebraska's highways in search of the state's most elusive former inhabitants. Tucker is a collector, seeking fossil evidence of Nebraska's prehistoric animal life. 
and much of his work is done solo in wide open spaces. A lot of the animals we find in the Nebraska fossil record seem very foreign, you know, elephants, camels, uh, horses like zebras, and it would have looked a lot more like Africa than Nebraska 13 million years ago. Checking rocks, sediments, and crevices are a big part of Tucker's job as a paleontologist at the University of Nebraska State Museum. Far less than 1% of the animals and their skeletons are ever preserved in the fossil records. It takes a lot of time learning the whole rock sequence within Nebraska. We determine fossils by the age and by the rocks that they're in. Tucker drives eight to 10,000 miles each year in his search for Nebraska's ancient wildlife. What makes Tucker's quest unique is his unlikely group of helpers. We're sitting right up over here. Okay. He's gonna grade for a four lane, but we're gonna pay for a two lane. What we're doing today is part of the Nebraska Highway Paleontology Program, which is a cooperative effort between the Nebraska Department of Roads and the University of Nebraska State Museum. I brought some bones out to kind of show you guys this is a complete lower jaw from a bison. You're kind of looking for that kind of cream-colored bone. These go extinct 10 to 14,000 years ago. This is pretty typical of what we find on a, on a road project once some heavy machinery hits a bone. It's a lot of little pieces, but those little pieces clue us into the area where the bone is eroding out of. And as you see in the bank here, uh, more bones have eroded out. So we have uh, the bottom end of a, of a bison uh, shoulder blade, and uh, this is just one of the bones in the back region. Just by finding the fragments, it keys us into an area where we may find more complete bones. And I follow road construction projects throughout the state, throughout the year, in order to save fossils from destruction by heavy machinery. Tucker checks 150 to 200 construction sites each year. Nebraska's Highway Paleontology Program was the first of its kind anywhere in the nation. Started in 1960, and so we've been going for 55 years now. And in that time frame, we found over 250,000 fossils. Fossils from nearly every county in the state, 91 of the 93 Nebraska counties. This road cut along a rural highway in northwest Nebraska is the latest site. Nebraska would have looked a lot different 13 million years ago. We would have had streams with very densely vegetated shorelines, subtropical forests. We would have had a lot of different animals living in those forests, things like elephants, camels, rhinoceros. Today, Tucker is excavating with members of the University of Nebraska State Museum and they're expecting a visit from a road construction crew. The contractors are usually a little bit hesitant, but when you tell them that they're gonna still be able to work, they think it's pretty cool um, that they're gonna be able to take part in this scientific discovery. We're actually doing a road project. We've got a nine mile of widening cable guardrail and resurfacing of the highway. We just stop here periodically every Every time it rained and see if something would come up, we'd spend five or 10 minutes looking and then we continue going on with the project. I do notice there is some right over here. These pieces here. They must have been covered up. Now uh, they were uncovered because of the rain. Kind of interesting that we're finding this much stuff out of such small holes. Hopefully we can find something a little bigger and a lot better than what we are right now. So we'll take this over and show to Shane that we are still finding pieces in this area just from this small excavation site. Hello. How are you doing today? Good. Back again, huh? Yeah, back again. Well, we were checking on the pile for you and it's kind of what we found when after the rainstorms and stuff. Okay, well this is this is super exciting. This is a, a little antelope jaw. You got uh, part of the, the skull here with the teeth sticking down. This would be a little uh, antelope that may be a foot, foot and a half tall. Um, 
if we if we found the antler of it, we'd tell which species of it. And this big one here, this is cool. This is a camel metapodial. So basically, these two bones in us have been fused together in a in a camel. So that's exciting. That would be a camel, probably uh, four and a half, five feet tall. It shows us there's really good potential for this particular road cut to produce fossils for us. Well, that's good. I hope we find a few more. Yeah, I hope so too. Two hours south, another roads crew tip leads to more complete fossil remains. Well, we have a skull and lower jaw of a fossil species of bison. Would have been roaming here somewhere between 14 and maybe 40,000 years ago. In addition to the skull and lower jaw, we're finding some of the vertebrae, maybe a portion of a rib here. So there's a, a fairly good chance we'll find an entire skeleton to this bison. Most people think of bison or buffalo as being native to the area with the Native Americans hunting them, millions of them on the plains. They weren't native to the area. They actually were an immigrant that came over from Asia relatively late in the Ice Age. This particular species goes extinct along with horses and camels and mammoths um, about 14,000 years ago. So this is a stream channel that's six to seven million years old. Um, Sharing this knowledge at events here, like this community did connects the public to the mission of the Highway Paleontology Program. This is an active scientific quarry, so all the fossils have to go back to the university. It's a chunk of a bigger bone. We've collected over 15,000 fossils, mostly small things, and I guarantee everybody will find a bone or at least a chip of bone today. It would be a flake of enamel. It tells us something about either climate or habitat. And each piece is, is more or less a, a piece to the big jigsaw puzzle. And the more pieces to the jigsaw puzzle we have, uh, the clearer picture we have as to what Nebraska looked like many thousands or many millions of years ago. Watch our stories online at netnebraska.org slash Nebraska Stories. And go to Facebook to like us and leave a comment. Join the Nebraska Stories conversation. Nebraska Stories is funded by the Margaret and Martha Thomas Foundation, the Nebraska Office of Highway Safety, Humanities Nebraska, the Nebraska Tourism Commission, and First Nebraska Bank. Sustained funding for arts coverage is provided by the H. Lee and Carol Gindler Charitable Fund, the Nebraska Arts Council, and Nebraska Cultural Endowment. <laughs>